First thing, what is up with this portrait on your wall? Harriet. When I feel like I need a good talking to, I just come and sit and have a conversation with Harriet. Hi, I'm Dr. Lauren Esposito, and I am the curator and Schlinger Chair of Arachnology at the California Academy of Sciences. This is Dr. Harriet Exline Frizzell. She was the first woman in the United States to get a PhD in arachnology. What Harriet was also was the first sort of de facto curator of arachnology here at the Cal Academy, and we never paid her. She got a PhD in arachnology, did a postdoc at Harvard, and then like did field work all over South America. And then in fact, it was like in the field where she first met her husband and then never had a paid job in arachnology. So her career was volunteer basis for her entire life. And she still loved arachnology and the Cal Academy's collection so much that after all of that, she left a donation in her will to support arachnology research here at the Academy, but stipulated that her portrait be hung in the office of the curator of arachnology. And that's why she's scowling. Well, at least that's the story I tell myself. I mean, I love having her in here. And my predecessor also loved having her in his office because I think she's really exemplifies, first of all, like doing incredible research. Like she had a really productive career in arachnology and she was a really important member of the arachnology community. Harriet mostly worked on spiders in North America. She worked on a group of spiders, which I like honestly don't care about because they're like, small and brown and not that interesting, even though I also work on small, brown, uninteresting spiders. I know that she described like quite a number of species of spiders, particularly here in, in North America. She was very well regarded. We have all of her professional and personal archives here at the Academy. So there's a bunch of correspondence and a graduate student of mine, Kate Montana, was researching Harriet's life and writing a biography about Harriet. And one of the things that she was really struck by in this correspondence was like the sheer number of people who wrote letters upon her death, like just expressing how important she was to them and how much she meant to them and I think that that was like really telling how influential she was in the field as a whole. She was also super important I think in terms of mentorship for many young arachnologists who went on to become also really impactful. As the current curator of arachnology here at the Academy it's not so much Harriet's research that I feel the impact of but rather her really careful attention to curation and the way that she set this collection that we have that's a world-renowned collection up for success for the future. I can only hope to leave like that kind of lasting impact on such an important scientific resource. And so, yeah, she's not going anywhere. It is so hard to, <laughs> to describe Alice's life in just a few sentences. She worked in the herbarium well into her 90s. My name is Dr. Sarah Jacobs, and I am a curator here in the botany department. Alice was a woman who was grabbed by botany and by plants very early in her life. She worked lots of different types of jobs in order to fund her interest in botany, starting in her early teens. Catherine Brandeggi was a curator here. She wanted to work with Alice, but funding wasn't necessarily available, and so I believe that Catherine Brandeggi took half of her salary to hire Alice as an assistant curator. Alice traveled very widely, especially in California. She was familiar with all of the species that are out here. She recognized when populations were new, unusual, or unique, and she named a lot of species. But she also did a lot of botanizing east of the Rockies, saying that she was an expert across North America would be a very fair assessment. Alice, as a superhero around the earthquake of 1906 is a great story. The earthquake hit in the early hours. She made her way from Knob Hill, where she was living, down to Market Street to check out how the museum fared. She knew that the fires were coming and had the foresight to try to rescue as many specimens as possible before the fires came in, which would ultimately decimate our collection. The herbarium was on one of the top floors. The staircases had begun to crumble, and so I envisioned her mountain nearing up the staircases and making her way up there. The herbarium cabinets did not have doors on them. I imagine that that earthquake shook the specimens out of the cabinets. She wrapped bundles of these specimens into her apron and lowered them over the banister of the crumbling staircases to a friend. She would lower the bundles over the banister, he would grab them and go and put them in a cart. And they did this until they were basically forced to leave. She saved well over a thousand specimens and those ultimately seeded the collection that we have in our herbarium today. 
We think of her as this force that really helped to build this collection and establish this academy as a center of botanical knowledge. I don't necessarily aspire to be Alice Eastwood, but I have a sense of the amount of dedication and work that she must have done to do all of the things that I have seen the products of. The amount of effort that it takes to collect that many specimens, to name all of those different species, to foster and nurture this collection, to advocate for the collection, like it is, um, well so maybe I do aspire to be like her in some ways. <laughs> She is something of a late bloomer. She started her botany career in her 50s, which even today is not super common. Hi, I'm Kate Montana, and I am a research assistant in the Arachnology Lab at the California Academy of Sciences. Inez Mejia was um, a Mexican-American botanist who did much of her collection work um, through the California Academy of Sciences. I believe she amassed about 150,000 specimens over the course of her career. But none of them were actually formally described by her, but some of them were named after her. So the reason I know about Inez is because I did a project called the Untold Stories of the Archives, where myself and some high school and undergraduate students looked through the archives here at the Cal Academy. So one of the materials that we looked at were Inez's scrapbooks, which were super interesting because she would take pictures and then you can see like her handwriting or her typewriter writing like little captions. And there was one with of two quails and it said like a friendly chat. Her parents were both American and Mexican. After spending her time in Mexico, she actually moved to San Francisco um, to seek treatment for some pretty severe mental illnesses, which I find interesting because that is another aspect of her story that I think humanizes her. And that's what brought her to San Francisco, then was able to take a botany course at um, at UC Berkeley. She enrolled there in her 50s. Then she started doing fieldwork in botany. She largely was collecting plants in Mexico and Central and South America and got to go on some expeditions with UC Berkeley, but then um, some after that, even on her own dime. She was definitely an adventurer and enjoyed the adventure of it all. I guess another thing that I think is sort of also important to talk about with Inez is that she also like held some somewhat problematic views about indigenous people and the places that she collected. Overall, her story reminds me that scientists are people who have complex identities. Inez inspires me to go out and see more of the world. She also makes me think about how I want to approach my own science from a place of understanding my positionality as a mixed race woman of color in science and how I can use both my privileges and my connection to more marginalized identities to improve science to be a more welcoming place. Overall, her legacy as a, like a groundbreaking female scientist is a story that we should keep in mind as we continue to build the science that we all want to see.